Terence Sheely was a far-sighted visionary Jesuit priest. Enraptured by the ancient trees growing on the gentle slopes of the glacial hills just west of Fort Wadsworth, he founded Mount Manresa in 1911, the first Catholic retreat house in the United States of America. But 101 years later, the future of Mount Manresa was already in grave doubt. The board of directors of Mount Manresa, a not-for-profit corporation, officially announced in 2006 a second-century campaign fund to reassure the public of their intention to remain on the property. In November 2011, a gala fundraiser garnered $850,000 between July 2012 and April 2013 alone. Nevertheless, in June 2012, the board of directors of Mount Manresa announced their intention to close the property the following year. In March 2013, the board of directors of Mount Manresa sent shockwaves of concern throughout neighboring communities when they revealed that they had entered into a contract to sell the property. The identity of the purchaser had been withheld from the public for many months before the Staten Island advance revealed that the Savo Brothers Construction Company was, indeed, the so-called secret purchaser. The Savo Brothers have a long history of high-density developments and a construction policy of take no open space prisoners. Thus, the Committee to Save Mount Manresa was born in a grassroots effort to preserve Mount Manresa as a public park. The Committee to Save Mount Manresa met with locally elected officials and urged them to craft a letter for the Charities Bureau of the New York State Office of Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, charging the Mount Manresa Board of Directors with fraudulent solicitation of funds. James Otto, Staten Island Borough President, Debbie Rose, New York City Councilwoman, Nicole Maliotakis, New York State Assembly, and Diane Savino, New York State Senate, could, acting in concert, politically leverage Mayor Bill de Blasio to exercise the legal doctrine of eminent domain to create a public park on the site of the former Mount Marisa property, now in the hands of the Savo Brothers Construction Company. We have a city budget of $80 billion. We have money from the state of New York that's set aside for acquiring property. This was how I was able to help create the state park on Toad Hill Road next to St. Francis Seminary. If you go by that now, you'll see a sign that says this is a state park. People may not realize it's a state park, but it is. And we preserved that property. Uh, uh, Mount Manresa was the first Jesuit retreat house in the United States, not in New York City, not in New York State, the first in the United States. And it was threatened with demolition, not to mention the destruction of the the 10,000 year old landscape that had never been destroyed. The city actually had had shown an interest in purchasing the property to you to reuse the property for people with developmental disabilities, the buildings and to open up the rest of the property essentially as local parkland. And they, they were planning to put in a bid when this property went to market. And the Catholic Church sold it on the side to the Savo brothers, as they have done throughout the city of New York with properties constantly. The water tower, the oldest water tower in the city of New York, I worked for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. We had, there's another water tower in Manhattan, built in 1868. That's preserved and protected as part of a park now. That was part of the original Croton system, water supply system. So here you have another water tower just supplying the property of a wealthy merchant built around 1861-62 that's going to be torn down, not protected. So the residence hall was also, although built around 1923, it was built by a landmark architect. 
and there was a beautiful chapel built around the same time period. So all these structures and a guardhouse that was there from the 1860s could have been saved, it could have been made into a park, Anyamal could have been there as a viable institution, or other, other not-for-profits could have been in there. I hear every day them destroying, whether it was the trees crashing down when they did that in April. I, I couldn't believe that I could be so affected by that happening. It was like 7 o'clock in the morning when I heard the trees crashing down. I was like, that my heart just like stopped. It's like someone was killing a part of my family. Mount Manresa is a place. It is a place. And things that have what's called a sense of place are very important to planners. Whether it's a neighborhood, an, indi an individual building or a site, or a landscape. And Mount Manresa had all of those things. So for me, looking at the story, which by the way, is the story of America, which is thoughtless destruction, not creative destruction. The Landmarks Commission may have begun in a way that guaranteed its independence. However, over the decades, we're now celebrating its 50th year of existence. Over the decades, it has clearly become a political tool and it, it allows the haves to be protected and the have-nots to be destroyed. Uh, and that's defined by those who control the Landmarks Commission. So the autonomy of the Landmarks Commission has been corrupted somehow. The, uh, the uh, autonomy of every agency has been corrupted because there are no checks and balances. The, the problem is that all of these agencies are directly controlled by the mayor. There is no other elected official which controls these agencies. During the 1920s, when Mount Manresa's buildings were constructed, asbestos was in common use in a variety of building materials, including concrete foundations, pipe insulation, and fireproofing materials. Asbestos is composed of barbed metallic fibers thinner than a human hair and invisible to the naked eye. Friable airborne asbestos fibers are closely associated with a broad spectrum of diseases including mesothelioma, asbestosis, and lung cancer, all with insidiously long latency periods often precluding early detection, diagnosis, or treatment. Unprotected demolition sites of asbestos-laden buildings like those of Mount Marisa, are certain to be rife with friable airborne asbestos. There are no precautions in, in place. The buildings are not fully encapsulated with negative air pressure, and there is no monitoring for lead and asbestos dust. We want to know, just like Jim Otto, our borough president, asked, why there is no stop work order at Mount Manresa. You know what, like I said, our inspectors are out there, our inspectors were on site, our inspectors have been on site every single day since this happened, okay? It was our inspectors who found it, it was our inspectors who put the stop work on. At the inspectors were, were arrested for, uh, for following a false claim that there was not asbestos on the property when there was. We had been saying this months ago that there was asbestos there. Remediate your zoning you're going to have, instead of 175,000 people here, you're going to have between 600 and 750,000 people living north of the expressway. At the 1961 zoning resolution, not stamped most places as R32 zoning, we could have had a lesser density in Staten Island. Your friendly narrator will update this film to reflect any forthcoming noteworthy news. Nevertheless, any proposal to downzone any area of Staten Island could take months, even years, or simply languish on the desks of an historically recalcitrant and virtually omnipotent New York City Department of City Planning.